And if you participated last time, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well during this difficult time of the pandemic. We're so pleased to have over 250 registrants from five countries and a wide variety of institutions. I'm Joan Lippincott, Associate Executive Director Emerita of CNI, and I'll be moderating the nine sessions of this series. Each of you is registered for all nine sessions, but don't worry if you need to skip some. We'll have recordings available for all sessions, as well as a set of questions to guide planning discussions on your own campus, and we've just put those up for session one. We have two speakers for this session and we'll take questions after each. Please type your questions in the chat box at any time. In addition, after the formal one hour session is over, we'll open the mics in case some of you wish to verbally ask questions of the speakers. The chat box is also available to communicate with each other or with me or our technical lead, Beth Sechrist. During the presentation, all participants will be muted. For this second session, we'll find out how two institutions are dealing with the impact of the COVID-19 virus on their normal digital scholarship programs. What can they continue, what changed and moved to the virtual environment and what has not been possible to continue at present. Our presenters today are Pamela Lack, Digital Humanities Librarian at San Diego State University and Chair of the ACRL Digital Scholarship Section, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, and Peter Leonard, Director of the Digital Humanities Lab at Yale University. Their bios are on the webinar site, and I won't take any more time with introductions in order to give our speakers more time. So over to you, Pam. Thanks so much, Joan. Um, I'm putting in chat the link to my slides, should anybody want to uh, download them and follow along. Uh, I'm really pleased and honored to be here today to talk to you a little bit about what our Digital Humanities Center has been doing during the pandemic and what the possibilities might look like beyond the pandemic, though it's a little hard to imagine beyond the pandemic right now. And I want to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Kumaye. So what I want to do today is tell you a little bit about what Digital Humanities looks like at San Diego State and then tell you a little bit about what it used to look like in our Digital Humanities Center, which I direct uh, before talking about the impact of the pandemic on our operations. So to begin with, San Diego State is part of the California State University System, which is the largest uni public university system in the country. We're a Hispanic serving institution and we have R2 status with R1 aspirations. Uh, and years before I arrived in September of 2016, there'd been a burgeoning digital humanities community that began the way so many do, um, faculty coming together across the disciplines to talk about the digital, talk about how they could use it in their teaching and in their research. And that informal community grew into a formal campus initiative that spans colleges and departments. Um, it is a research, strategic research priority of our university. And that came with a faculty cluster hire, of which I was hired into, um, as well as a commitment from the library, not only to create a space, but to fund the space, um, at least the startup of the space. So when I arrived in the fall of 2016, I began talking to the community um, and engaging with our uh, faculty, staff, and students to do visioning uh, work for the center. And rather than focus on particular equipment or um, uh, furniture or different types of sort of zones of the space, we focused more on articulating a shared vision and a set of shared values for the space that would drive the design and everything we did in the space. Um, and so um, using that, we were able to launch the space in uh, January of 2018, largely as a bit of a blank slate um, not fully designed so that we had room to grow. And the space was really intended not just as the home and the hub of the campus-wide digital humanities initiative, but um, as a physical and visual representation of our shared values, which include but are not limited to non-hierarchical feminist collaboration, caring for ourselves and for each other, engaging in transparent and ethical labor practices that give credit to each other, visible credit to each other, um, engaging in um, work that is process oriented, not just product minded, 
And I think most importantly, thinking about exposing and hoping to uh, address the uneven and often harmful impact of digital technologies on different cultures. So after our launch in 2018, we began growing quickly, developing a formalized programmatic uh, set of services, uh, largely focused on different event tracks, as well as um, heavy connection to the curriculum, uh, bringing classes into the space, not just for one shot instruction, but throughout the project life cycle from beginning a project to, as you see here, a, a class showcase of students showing off their final projects. Actually, that they were showing off the drafts of their projects here. Um, throughout this whole process, I engaged in iterative community driven design, observing and talking to folks about how they wanted to use the space, how they were trying to use it to engage in critical digital inquiry. inquiry, inquiry in, <laughs> that's a word I can't say this morning. Um, I'll skip that. Um, and also begin designing out some of the peripheral spaces that we hadn't yet um, designed when we um, first began. Uh, we first launched the space. So last fall, we launched a new space for engaged learning and doing in digital humanities. And we launched many several studios um, in uh, alignment with new areas in the curriculum, uh, addressing the increased interest in podcasting, both for scholarly communication and for teaching, uh, a, rise, a growing electronic literature program, a new 3D animation program, and many others. But that programmatic growth was not without its ch uh, challenges, and we faced really two main challenges. The first was um, a sort of constantly changing staff model where we, at any given time in, during our operations, had a different number of staff at different um, levels of um, uh, commitment to the center from half time to full time. Um, at, my, at the peak, we had two full time staff lines. Um, both of those staff left by the end of the fall to pursue uh, better paying jobs outside of the university. And so we're constantly onboarding folks and trying to sort of fill gaps with temporary hires. At the start of the spring semester, I had, uh, spring 2020, I had one full-time temporary uh, emergency hire on a three month contract subject to renewal and two student assistants helping to run all of the programs of the center. Uh, the, other big challenge that we faced was more of a facilities or infrastructure problem. The new floor that had been stalled for the initial launch of the Digital Humanities Center failed within about six months of our opening. And so last summer we closed down to get a new floor. And as, as is often the case with construction, it was delayed and we weren't able to reopen until mid-November of 2019. At that time, my, uh, the co-director of the Digital Humanities Initiative and I had decided not to engage in uh, any sort of public facing events beyond my DH instruction outside of the DH center. So we hit pause on all of our programming um, and tried to engage our community virtually through blogging and other means. But I think more often than not, people thought we had just kind of disappeared or petered out. And so that was a real problem for us in losing a lot of the momentum we had gained in, in growing our community over the years. So we reopened in mid-November and by January we'd settled on yet another staffing model, um, a temporary staffing model while I searched for two full-time staff. Um, and we had a full calendar of events ready to go for spring 2020 when the pandemic hit. And um, as with so many uh, folks, this was, you know, utter, uh, it was chaotic and confusing and kept, things kept changing rapidly. When it became clear that our library and in fact our campus was going to shut down, I hit pause on everything. And rather than try to scramble and port everything into the virtual, the way that the teaching faculty were quickly pivoting to virtual instruction, I decided to um, stop everything. So I canceled all of our upcoming programs and we had quite a few on the calendar for the spring and really figure out what it was we needed to do to quickly get some messaging out that said that even though the center was closed, we, the staff, were still here for everybody and that the center was more than just the space, but the staff and, and the resources we could bring to the table. I then spent some time thinking about all of the competing needs and demands. Uh, for one, needing to keep my staff working. My uh, temporary emergency hire staff member um, was up for renewal in, on her contract in early April. And we were very nervous that we'd be able to get her renewed during the pandemic without her being able to do a lot of the sort of day-to-day -day operational work that she had been doing to support the space. So I needed to think about a way to 
make the case for her essentialness so that we could get her um, renewed and keep her working during the pandemic until she was ready to start library school this fall. I also needed to think about how to keep our student assistants working virtually when they too could not be supporting our daily operations. I also really wanted to think about how to maintain community. We'd lost so much momentum in the fall with our unanticipated closure that I was really nervous about not doing anything during the pandemic and really losing the community completely. But I also wanted to be mindful of the fact that this was an incredibly stressful and anxious time. Faculty were struggling to um, adapt to online instruction. Many were uh, taking care of their children and homeschooling them um, and trying to find time to do their own work. Um, so I didn't want to ask folks to do too much. So to get restarted, I did what I normally do. I went back to the community and I asked them, what is it you need and what is it you can handle? How much can you actually do right now? And based on that, I developed a new set of virtual programs um, programs that were never intended in the face-to-face -face world um, that were modified from in face-to-face -face events and designed for the virtual uh, with low expectations for what what people needed to do to show up so rather than a robust research group that we normally have every month for faculty we just engaged in light readings exploration of readings about digital pedagogy to help them right there with their virtual instruction uh, that events to try to bring people together to keep the community going. And then in lieu of full on robust workshops, tool a week, tool exploration in uh, over Zoom, in part to um, help me learn how to teach a tool over Zoom, and in part to manage people's expectations about what was possible in Zoom, because at that time I didn't know. Uh, a quick assessment of our tool a week showed that it was really successful. We had um, much higher attendance than we would normally have in a face to face event and um, folks came with very little prior knowledge and articulated a sort of eagerness to use what they had learned um, beyond the workshop uh, the tool a week event. Uh, we also attracted far more people outside of SDSU than I was anticipating, making me think about what access looks like for a digital humanities center once it virtualizes. Now, while I was developing these virtual programs, I was also trying to think about um, ways of keeping my staff working in a non-exploitative way. And we developed a project to create tool tutorials uh, in large part to support virtual instruction um, and to show how the DH Center could still contribute to the campus efforts to pivot during the pandemic. We aligned the tutorials um, based on strategic campus priorities, particularly the push to in, uh, improve access to Adobe Creative Cloud. Um, this year it is free for everybody, including our students, and faculty were being encouraged to use it in the classroom. So my staff person focused on creating a lot of Adobe tutorials to help faculty do this very quickly with virtual instruction. We also identified uh, tools that I commonly used in my instruction that were being used for class projects. And we encouraged our student assistants to explore those tools and find ones that they found interesting, do a deep dive and become experts in them so that they could engage in peer-to-peer -peer instruction, developing slides and videos and transcripts, often in English and Spanish, to support, um, to support their, their colleagues, their peers, and for us to support our faculty. We started releasing these tutorials over the summer and we'll have more coming out um, this fall with my new, um, I have a, a temporary position um, that I'm sharing with our makerspace. So I have a half-time person working on more tutorials uh, this semester. And what I realized about the tutorials is that th this had always been a strategic priority of the Digital Humanities Initiative at San Diego State. We'd always wanted to create what we call digital literacy modules, sort of really easy plug and chug things that faculty could easily pull into their classes. And I never had the bandwidth in the face-to-face -face world to be able to do this. But going um, to the fully virtual pandemic world actually enabled us to, you know, go back to these basics, leverage these affordances, and actually create something that we could then use successfully to demonstrate my staff person's essentialness, to get her renewed, to keep our staff, our student assistants working in ways that they were actually learning something and having fun doing it. Um, so it was a really gratifying experience. Now, as we were doing this in the center, we were doing similar um, work with the D Digital Humanities Initiative. At the end of the spring semester, we pulled together our faculty advisory board, which had largely been um, dormant since uh, for this year, in part because of the closure of the center in the fall. 
um, and we came together as a group and we talked about what is it we need and what is it we can do? How can we as DH faculty lead in this pandemic moment? And we realized, well, we're, we've already been engaging with digital tools in our teaching. We're already highly interdisciplinary and collaborative. And we already, already think about the impact of digital technologies on humans and, and really are human centered. And so as a group, we committed to articulating those values in a more visible way with the crea creation of this website, Teaching During Quarantine. Uh, ostensibly created for fall uh, virtual instruction. Uh, we've already learned uh, that our spring will also be virtual uh, across the CSU. And this is not, this was intended not as added work for our faculty, but really uh, a curation and aggregation of existing work that our faculty were doing in their classes. So part one uh, involves ways that faculty were using different tools in the class, and it includes assignments, assessments, tutorials that I've created, and sample student work. Part two emphasizes helping students think critically about digital technology and culture. And then a third section focuses on virtual programming that can support virtual instruction this semester. And um, this website, which we launched uh, July 1st, has been really generative. It's led to new points of contact for my own DH instruction. It's led to new sections of the website based on conversations that it sparked in particular how to create a, a, a learning community in Zoom, a trusted and, and supportive learning community. And also it's led to new um, sort of innovations. Um, we have a section on digital annotation and folks were really interested in using Hypothesis, the social annotation tool um, in, in their classes this semester. And through this website and the conversation it sparked, we were actually able to get Hypothesis integrated into our Canvas learning management system by the start of the fall semester which we were all somewhat surprised, pleasantly surprised we were able to do so quickly. We, have we are launching a new set of virtual programs this semester, much fewer programs than we normally would offer. We normally have four tracks for our events, this semester just two. Our workshops are aligned with the curriculum, so either workshops I'm doing in classes that we're opening up to the public, or the five-part pod podcasting workshop series that launches this Friday at one o'clock uh, Pacific time, which is aligned with the growing interest in podcasting in the curriculum as well as uh, with faculty uh, engagement. Um, our virtual lecture series for the most part focuses on recent publications coming out of DH faculty. So it's meant to highlight the work we're doing and not create more work for anybody. So our goal here with this, as with everything we've been doing, is not to do more with less, as we've, we are increasingly going to be asked to do in a time of sort of budget austerity, but to do less with greater impact. So where does that leave me today? Um, it's not, uh, the pandemic has not been without its challenges. Uh, the biggest one uh, has been, um, what does it mean to uh, be a space without the space? And how are we still a digital humanities center without a space to bring people together? Uh, one of the things I've really been struggling to do and have not been able to figure out yet is how to provide safe access to specialized equipment uh, in support of virtual instruction. Um, and when I say safe, I don't mean just safe for the faculty using it or the staff who are supporting that, but also our, our cleaning, our facilities cleaning crew who have to come in and clean anytime someone comes into the building. How do we do this in a safe way that protects everybody and still supports virtual instruction? I was working on a plan for this um, all summer and then I hit pause when I started to see um, campuses back east reopening and then quickly closing. And our campus has been no different. Our library, which had opened at the start of our semester is now closed again. I should say it was partially open. Um, and I'm still thinking about what it means to provide access to specialized equipment and I don't yet have, have any answers to that. But I would say that um, what I've been doing throughout the pandemic is trying to see this as a moment of reinvention and reimagining. Um, it's clear to me that um, I won't be able to return to what I had done before the pandemic. It's just not going to be possible. It's not clear when I'll have a, be fully staffed. We have no idea yet what the long-term budget implications of the pandemic will be. We've got some early projections for the next couple of years, but we don't really quite know what that's going to mean. So how can we continue to articulate for the importance of the space 
without the space? And how can we continue to bring people together in this kind of organic way that sparks conversation and, and, and sparks ideas and, and mutual collaboration? It's really hard to recreate this in a Zoom environment, try as we might. How do we do this in a way that doesn't just pile on to our faculty with everything that they're doing and our students for that matter? So I've been trying to think through these possibilities and take this as an opportunity opportunity to reimagine. So one of the things my, uh, the co-director of the DH initiative and I have been thinking about is how can we transform the initiative and the space simultaneously during and after the pandemic to begin thinking about how we can seed research. We have still some startup funds from the early days of the initiative um, that we could use to seed research projects, research centers, and bring those into the center and rather than focus on programmatic events, um, we could be engaging in the space to seed th this research and generate new research. This is just one of many ideas we're, we're um, tossing around right now. What I would say as um, a final set of uh, reflections and takeaways is that, and I've kind of already said this already, but reopening, whatever that means during the pandemic cannot be a return to business as usual. Uh, we have to think about all sorts of new concerns about safety, uh, public health, equity and access, things that we never had to think about before or not quite in this, in this way. And that re reopening after the pandemic cannot be a return to the way things were. Um, we are in a moment of forced disruption. And I think that there's an opportunity to here to think um, creatively about this if we allow it, if we allow ourselves to. And so what I've been doing throughout the entire time and what I, um, what I encourage folks here in the, in the virtual room here to think about, whether you're trying to reopen your center or launch a new center during or after the pandemic, is to sort of go back to basics and think about who, it, who we are, what is it we do, how do we do it, and most importantly, why do we do it? And if we stay centered on our community and our community's shared values and shared vision, as much as that evolves over time, we can find a way uh, to safely reopen now and, and, and sort of see ourselves transformed in the future. Thank you. Pam, that was amazing. And we have a few questions, which I'll get to in just two seconds, I really have a rhetorical question. Given your small staff, do you ever sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Very little. <laughs> I'm a workaholic and an insomniac. <laughs> uh, so the first question is, can you talk a little bit about the reading group activity? We're considering something similar and would love to hear more about it, the planning, engagement, attendance, and someone uh, seconded that and said they're forming one at their institution, and how do you maintain the momentum? And this would be for the reading group activity. Yeah, we had a, a sort of a research reading group uh, for, among faculty for many years, and typically we would get about a dozen faculty. It would meet monthly over lunch, and we would provide lunch, um, and we would engage in a set of shared readings um, we'd take turns facilitating uh, the discussion of those readings. And sometimes we would actually engage in more formal uh, presentation of research. And the purpose of that research group was to develop a shared vocabulary and a shared understanding that could then pot pot potentially generate new research collaborations. Um, with the virtual reading group, um, I was really cautious about asking folks to do more work to get ready so I didn't want to assign reading in advance. So we picked the um, digital, um, what's it? Sorry, I'm, I'm blanking on the name. Digital, I have to look at my cheat sheet here. It's a digital pedagogy reader that had just come out. And we encouraged folks, um, rather than read it, to just explore. So explore it, um, bring something of interest. And then we invited one of the co-editors who is up at San Jose State, which is another CSU. Um, she came and sort of talked about the development of this volume. Um, and so it was much lower expectations than normal. We're not actually rerunning that reading group this semester. We decided to hit pause on that um, because it, we thought it would be too much labor for our faculty who have very heavy teaching loads. Um, and so, um, but, at, but last spring, we had about a dozen folks show up, and not just faculty, but students as well. 
I would add that I limited this to San Diego State because I saw it as a community building activity. So I didn't allow non SDSU folks into the room for that other than the co editor. Um, and it was really just a conversation about um, how to how to engage with digital in the classroom. We didn't actually talk about anything sort of concrete um, or concrete tools or anything like that. Um, uh, and so I think if I were to do it again, I might pose some questions uh, when we announce the event to get folks sort of a little bit more focused and ready to talk. Thank you. Uh, the next question gets to something you mentioned at the end of your presentation about getting back to first principles. And uh, you're asked, I'm interested in the founding values of the center, the feminist project development, et cetera, and how those translate to the virtual. Has it been seamless? That's a, a really wonderful question. Um, well, I, would, I guess I would say nothing has been seamless in the pandemic. Um, so, um, uh, so I'm not sure about that, but that's really been my touchstone throughout the whole thing. So trying to make sure that everything we do is um, driven by these, these principles of caring for each other and ourselves and, and equity um, and, um, and, and uh, visibility. So for instance, with the Teach DH website, the Teaching During Quarantine, um, my co-director, Jessica Pressman, did a lot of the heavy lifting and originally didn't put her name on the website anywhere. And I, I pushed back and I insisted that she put her name on it and that we give her credit for the work that she did. And if you go through that website, you'll notice that every faculty member who contributed to it in one way or another is listed. So that was one way that we tried to sort of stick to those values and, and, and continue making them visible and articulatable. I don't know if that completely answered the question. And then a comment, uh, love the idea of the community user group and having users help to continue to shape and share knowledge, to have experts on campus teach and share their knowledge. Uh, I don't know if you want to expand on that or if I should go to the next question. Um, I think you can go to the next question, but thank, thank you to whoever said that. Uh, and our next question, you mentioned getting feedback from your community. How did you do that? Surveys or direct emails or other methods? Uh, during the pandemic, it was largely surveys because that was the easiest way to reach people. Um, and we didn't get a lot of people filling out the surveys because, it, you know, there were so many surveys going around at that time. Um, and then using uh, the feedback mechanism for our tool a week uh, generated a lot of feedback. But it was also a lot of emails and just any time we were in a Zoom room together, just trying to, to talk not just about the work we were trying to do in the Zoom room, but how things were going. So starting every meeting with, you know, how are you doing? Um, how, how's it going? And using that to drive the needs of the community, um, to, art to articulate a shared set of needs and drive the work that we do and really stay focused on that. Uh, I want to invite the uh, participants to put any links to their own programs that they may be doing that are particularly innovative during the pandemic. So please add them and share them with each other in the chat if you would like. I think, um, Pam, you've really given us um, an exceptional look at your creativity and innovation during this time. And I'm sure that many of the participants are gonna take ideas from uh, what you've shared. So thank you so much. And now we're going to move on to Peter Leonard and Peter, please proceed and share your slides. All right, thank you, Joan, for the invitation and thanks very much, Pam, also to starting us off. Um, I'm starting my timer and I'm starting my slides in one second. There we go. And great. So let me pull us into, can everybody see my slides? Joan might have to hold up a thumb or something. Yes, Peter. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm here to talk about digital at a, at a distance, um, continuity of DH, or the most we can do to ensure continuity of DH um, research services during a pandemic. Um, I come to you as the director of the Digital Humanities Lab at Yale University Library here in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, I'm uh, one of many members of the lab. We have um, a great team of collaborators who've come on since 2015-16 when we founded the lab. Um, so these are all the folks with whom I work every day. This is when we could take pictures in the space. Uh, we, we haven't been in in a while. 
Um, but this is the room we were given. So the folks who um, have not had a chance to come to New Haven and visit Yale Library, um, you know, it's really interesting when you're setting up a digital humanities lab, uh, you never want to look a gift horse in the mouth. Our uh, university librarian said, we think we can, um, we can arrange to have this room serve as a new uh, physical space for the digital humanities lab. Um, this is quite a striking room. It's for, it is very much of the 1930s um, when the building was built by John Gamble Rogers. Uh, it is, of course, a 1930s understanding of early English Renaissance. So it is a, a Tudor fantasy in many ways. We undertook a, a large renovation project to try to um, keep the beauty of this room while also making it more responsive to modern research methods. And this is an image of what the room looked like shortly after its reopening in late 2018. Um, this is uh, some Yale graduate students demonstrating their work on one of the screens we have around the room. That's Jub Sankofa there. Uh, he's standing next to some digital humanities books, which are in the original 1930s bookcases, but we changed the bookcases to show the covers of the books rather than the spines. And you might see a couple more images of these books as we uh, go forward through uh, the rest of the images of my presentation. Um, we, we find that the physical volumes about digital humanities about critical big data studies. Um, those are really books that start a lot of conversations in the room. And then finally, at the sort of the back right there, you'll see one of my colleagues, Doug, who's working in this glass special projects cube. And I'll be talking about each of these spaces and each of these affordances, the screens, the books, the room, and what's changed since we had to shut down in March. I do want to just offer a really quick note about where we are here in New Haven, where we are at Yale in regards reopening. And so one thing that's important to say is that although we closed our physical doors to the library in March, the library never closed in terms of its services that it provided to scholars. Um, we reopened the physical doors in early September and most undergraduates were then able to come about a week later. We had about a week of a soft launch. And so now as if today we have um, the undergraduate, graduate and faculty populations who are still physically present in New Haven are able to get into the library. That's not the entire population, of course. And so one of the, the themes I'll be returning to is the question of how a digital humanities lab can help ensure access and equity to what is now a geographically dispersed student body and, and for that matter, even faculty body. Um, but the library is now reopened. Uh, as a physical space, most staff, including myself, are not going into the library every day. And so what I'll be talking about is how do we, how does a physical lab change when we don't have the same presence in the space? How do we have to transform that space? How do we have to transform our services to ensure some kind of um, sort of research service continuity, even when things are still um, changing? I should also acknowledge we're very lucky in Connecticut. We have, we understand ourselves to be on the right side of the distribution in this current moment. Things could change in terms of the impact of COVID. It's not an impact that is evenly distributed across socioeconomic boundaries, even within the city of New Haven. Um, so there's a lot of disparities. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at where we are across all 50 states, I think that we're, um, we're encouraged by the general health situation in Connecticut. So broadly, um, I'm going to go through what was continued throughout the physical closure and now that the room is reopened. I'm also talk about what we've had to change to adopt to new circumstances and digital humanity support. I'll talk about what we stopped doing and, and how we plan to restart it. So one of the things to say is that, you know, maybe virtual consultations and training um, and project work is the easiest thing to move online. It's not to say that Zoom is a perfect medium. It's the opposite of a perfect medium. But at least we understand how to set up, um, you know, uh, drop in office hours to have continue existing conversations that we've had with some existing clients and to help serve new clients through uh, digital mediums such as Zoom. Um, we have continued to hire graduate assistants who help us out at those virtual consultations. So my colleague Kathy DuRose has done a great job of um, rehiring a bunch of students who had the, the roles, the people who were in those roles had graduated. We've continued to interview and hire during the shutdown to ensure that we have the right team there to help people with digital humanities questions. One of the other things uh, that we have noticed is that there's a change in what people are coming to us for. People are now really eager to talk about ways of sharing data and research work online. Um, 
software that people always had thought about or sort of mentioned, they're suddenly being forced to work with every day. They're being forced to set up shared Zotero bibliographies. They're asking us really interesting questions about can we share a trophy file over like Dropbox or Box so that a researcher who's cut off from their research assistant can still input data into the same database. Um, keeping uh, repositories on Dropbox, things like that. So virtual consultations and training are a core part of what we do, and they've been um, in some way not the hardest thing to move online, um, even though certainly there are some things that we all like better about in-person interactions. We've also done a lot of um, tried to continue to do our outreach and global engagement. There are programs such as Yale Young Global Scholars who come to us every summer for um, a brief introduction to DH, sort of a, getting a sense of, of what digital humanities is. We did ask for permission for the students um, uh, to be able to use their image in this context. So that's real live students who were being uh, trained by Kathy up at the top left. Um, normally these folks come to New Haven. They come to New Haven from India, from, Af from many countries in Africa, from China, all over the world. This year they couldn't come to New Haven for a million different reasons. We were committed to continuing doing that kind of outreach work um, over Zoom, even though we couldn't welcome them into the Frankie family room. Um, another thing you remember, and you should, we should have known to begin with, but um, certainly having a large percentage of our group uh, abroad meant that we have, were sort of confronted with access restrictions to American companies' websites, such as GitHub or Google Maps. If you tell everybody, follow this tutorial on GitHub, and GitHub happens to be banned in a particular country, you're, you're going to have to scramble to, to do something else. Um, we also have a physical room that I showed you a couple pictures of. And what I'm showing you now is a floor plan of the room roughly as it was when we opened in October of 2018. And um, although this is gonna be hard to see probably over Zoom, you can see tables and you can see chairs. And trust me when I say that every single one of those uh, chairs was usually occupied by students studying or working on a digital humanities project throughout the day. This is the current layout. And what I've tried to do in the current layout of our lab is to only put a red dot where people are allowed to sit given the physical distancing rules. The, I wasn't able to erase every single chair, but trust me, those chairs aren't there anymore. The only things that are there are the red dots. And so one of the big transformations we did in, in our room was to reduce the seating, de-densify the seating, allow people to study in the room, to work in the room, to conduct research in the room, but not be too close to other people. Um, we also did some transformations to our digital signage. So you might have seen in one of the first images I showed you, a graduate student was showing his work on um, African-American juveniles and the criminal justice system. Um, and those screens still can be used that way as presentation media, but they now also show, of course, coronavirus safety information. So at the top left, you're seeing a six foot distance sign and at the bottom right, you're seeing, you know, wash your hands, keep them clean. You're also seeing some of our digital humanities books in the um, bookshelves there. So we did do that early intervention to just make sure that when we reopened in September that all of our, we, we figured that we love data visualization, but in the current moment, what we have to visualize is the crucial safety steps. They're gonna keep our scholarly community safe and that we were willing to kind of uh, de-emphasize the data visualization story um, so that people can continue to enjoy the room and in a safe manner. I mentioned before the, um, we have a kind of glass area of the room, the special projects cube, and uh, that area is shown here back in 2018. So that area is set off and it's set off um, because it has some equipment in it like VR goggles and a scanner I'll be talking about in a moment. But I want to talk about how the equipment in this cube in the middle of the room has continued to work even when the room has been empty from March through September. And so I thought I'd talk about a couple different projects that we've been working on. Um, this is a machine in the cube which basically manages all of the raw data from companies such as uh, Gail Cengage or ProQuest or Elsevier, all the companies that we license data from in the, in the Yale library system. And that you can see on the right, there's a big silver box. That's a, a large storage area for all of the images and text that comes to us from vendors. So that, um, th that computer has continued to process all of those images um, and all of that data. And I'll be talking about in a little bit more uh, in, a, in a bit how we've uh, managed to get that data to users. But certainly it's a problem because we used to invite them into the cube to hook up at one of their own hard drives to get access to a data source such as Evo or Echo or some licensed material. Of course, after they had signed an agreement, understanding, you know, making them aware of licensing and copyright. 
Other things that are going on in our cube, we've done, we have some specialized um, digitization equipment. And what I'm showing you here on the right is actually a video of me uh, in the basement scanning microfilm because we had a microfilm scanner that we had traditionally used for text and data mining projects. And we really shifted the use of some of that specialized equipment to just general access to materials during the pandemic because we, although before we would have said we want to help out people get data off of microfilm for text and data mining for sort of digital humanities purposes, when all of our, when the entire library's clients were no longer able to come into the library, we realized we had some specialized equipment that could ease access to material. There's so much amazing historical material trapped on microfilm. So we um, did uh, shift this over to more general purpose access. Again, there are still licensing and in some cases copyright questions around uh, microfilm. So this is not stuff we're able to put online for everyone, but it's in response to specific user queries for I need this particular newspaper. Um, I ended up scanning about 20,000 pages over the course of the time that we were, had our doors closed. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures from 2020. This is a palimpsest of two different monitors in the cube. Um, you can see at the very back, that's a uh, keep your hands clean, wash your hands, go to covid19.yale.edu. In the front, there's one of our workstations that's doing some deep learning, some artificial intelligence. You can see all of the cores there on the screen and the um, GPUs, which are doing even more sophisticated inference. So while the room was closed, um, and even after the room is now uh, opened up, the specialized equipment in the uh, lab has continued to support digital humanities research projects. And I'll start this off. Um, let's see if I can increase my volume so people can hear a little bit. Um, if you like Schoenberg, you'll love this. This is music uh, being composed by a flocking algorithm. So it's basically a semi-deterministic sort of deep learning way of asking notes to be composed by sort of random birds that behave in certain ways, virtual birds, no birds were harmed. Um, so this is in the service of a uh, experimental opera project being done by a professor at Yale. And so we were helping them out with a little bit of um, artificial intelligence for music composition. I guess that's a great way to save time. Um, we are also doing some computational work on photography. So what I'll show you on the screen here is, this is a, a generative adversarial network that is hallucinating cars. And that is to say, it's a network that's been trained on automobiles and we are then sampling from that network and asking it to kind of dream up cars that never existed but might have. Uh, the ground truth for this project, the original data that we train the network on is several hundred thousand automobiles photographed by Ed Ruscha, kind of accidentally as part of his multi-decades work driving a van or having his staff drive a van down the Sunset Strip and other streets in Los Angeles. And this is part of a research collaboration with the Getty. So what you're seeing here is essentially, again, a hallucination of the automobile that sort of that symbol of Los Angeles, um, after having observed hundreds of thousands of automobiles in the late mid century, this network tries to dream up automobiles that might exist. It's essentially like uh, deep faking uh, Los Angeles. We also have uh, other work in the textual domain. So this is, um, these are imaginary rare books that we're working on um, that we have sort of sampled from a network a textual network this time. So not a musical network, not a visual network, a textual network. These are books that don't exist, but they were um, hallucinated by a network that had learned the 12,000 books that uh, in the rare domain that Yale's acquired since the 1940s. So if you look closely at one of these, you'll start to see it, it's plausible. And then you will run into a clause where you think, you know, maybe this book doesn't quite exist. Um, all of this material, the, the sort, of, um, sort of generation of music, the hallucination of new cars from Ed Ruscha's archive, the sort, of, um, the sort of forgery of new rare books drawn from the bibliographic tradition of institutions at Yale like the Beinecke, which have been collecting special rare material for decades. All of this was done in the equipment that was still in the room. And so my point is that that equipment kept working even when we couldn't be in the building and when more importantly, our, our clients couldn't be in the building, we were able to do this work on the, the GPUs and using the AI hardware uh, and keep those research processes going. So what were the consequences or effects of the multi-month uh, period where our doors were closed, our services continued, and now our doors are back open? 
um, to welcome folks in at a reduced level. Well, the obvious point is that we have a much lower room capacity, and it's not just a de-densified room, it's a room in which the original vision of having the tables and chairs be infinitely movable um, to allowable collaboration, of course, we've had to disable that. We've had to fix the chairs and tables in place to the degree that we can, um, and that's really heartbreaking because the room was really set up to allow collaboration and sort of informal gathering, and now we have these very serious public health restrictions on that type of work. Um, the thing that hits me a lot is the removal of in-person uh, expertise from the room. So my office is in that room, my team's office is in that room, and we're basically not in the room as an effort now, as part of our effort to de-densify the library. Um, shared equipment, the high the high powered computers that people come in and use when their own you know, MacBook Air 11 inch just wasn't up to the task, we've had to remove that for the same public safety reasons. Um, putting goggles on your face for Oculus Rift is not gonna happen for a while. So that's really too bad. Um, on the other hand, um, it does ensure that we can help the room be used in a safe manner. Mentioned before, in terms of shifting things to Zoom, we don't have those in-person consultations anymore. And it's not just DH. Um, I think uh, Miriam Olivares, who's our GIS librarian here at Yale, may be on the uh, video. Uh, and she came, used to come to our room to meet with people who needed help using mapping or geospatial technologies. We're no longer to offer, able to offer that kind of in-person meetings with an expert. No more in-person workshops. Although that's something that has actually spurred us to do some work on uh, virtualizing those workshops. Um, certainly uh, what Pam was talking about earlier is something we really aspire to. And now I think as we put that into effect, we'll, have, we'll be left with a great repository of asynchronous or on-demand videos that might help equalize access to this information because of course not everybody is gonna be in the Eastern time zone. Uh, mentioned before the Gale Cengage and uh, ProQuest data that we gave to researchers after they understood the licensing restrictions. We can no longer invite them into our cube and, and have them hook up their own hard drives. We have to figure out other ways of them getting that large information. Had to remove all of our introductory brochures um, and change all of our signage information to reflect more COVID-centric messaging. So what's, what's gonna happen as we try to um, restart some of these in-person services? Um, I uh, think one of the things we can uh, not just restart, but actually extend is some of the bulk digitization we've been contributing to, specifically around microfilm. Many historians and humanists are passionate about the, um, the material that's locked on microfilm and the uh, possibilities of doing uh, just uh, extraction of those images and OCR on them. I'm working on a way to kind of split that scanning task up to meet our sort of labor environment at Yale. So we have some paraprofessional and some professional workers. Um, in terms of equity and access, we know that not everybody can physically come into the library anymore. Um, and so the question is, can we, in, can we, once we have a workflow set up, can we have a button in a, um, in next to a microfilm reel in our online catalog that says, I would like, you know, 16 images from this reel. Can we make that a one-click uh, button so that somebody can then scan those items and OCR them and get them to the patron subject to copyright and licensing? Because we know that um, the way that the travel networks are and the way visa problems are, not everybody will be able to do their work physically at Yale libraries. Um, getting raw access, uh, access to data for text and data mining purposes, um, can we, for those folks who are not uh, physically in the states and may not have great bandwidth, can we mail hard drives to them uh, full of the data that they need to analyze for their work? I don't have an answer to that yet, but I think it's something we want to work on. Consultations and training, as I mentioned before, um, we have uh, continued to hire for those consultations, the graduate workers who work us with that, um, but we don't know when we'll be able to resume in-person consultations and training. Um, we may need to a, a sort of continue the virtual option because not everybody can return to New Haven and, and that whole scale return of uh, Yale to uh, Yale's affiliates to New Haven may take a long time uh, for to really come true. And then finally, I think, the return to staff offices to uh, make sure that the room isn't just a room with books and screens and computers, but that it's full of people who care passionately about DH. Um, we just don't know the timeline for that. And we're all wondering about large scale changes in work patterns um, after uh, coronavirus. But I do think for me personally, having that community in the room, the offices open right off the room, um, having that interaction between students and faculty and staff is really a key part of our vision. And so that's something that I'm really, I would love to get to a point where that is um, no longer such a problem. And with that, I'll stop the slides and uh, I think we can shift to questions.
Thank you so much, Peter. I think that it was a real treat for all of us to get a glimpse into some of those really fascinating projects uh, as a bonus to your presentation about the difficulties of doing so much of this work during the pandemic. Um, so far, we have one question which uh, was uh, put into the chat right before you started to talk more specifically about opening up. Um, and the, the question was that uh, she'd like to hear more about how the physical lab um, is being used for DH work. Wasn't clear how much of the space or any had been repurposed for general use and how is access to the, techno to the DH technology managed and supported. And right. you also specify, did, did you just open in September, you know, or are people starting to come in now or is this in a couple of weeks or? Yeah, it's a great question. So just on that last thing, um, the, the, the main doors of Sterling, uh, the, the main, what most undergrads would think of as the library, although there are many libraries, um, reopened um, last week. And then most uh, undergrads had about a week later, they had to wait, most of them due to quarantining. There are always exceptions. Folks who are from Connecticut or New Haven had some different rules. But um, in general, we've only seen patrons in our space for the last couple days. Um, and so that's been really, and undergrads, there have been some faculty and grad students. But I think that touches with the first question you, you were um, telling us about, which was the breakdown of the space between like specialized DH usage and then general usage. And um, although Sterling has a lot of beautiful rooms, uh, the, the mo more than most, where I went to college, we had one room that looked like this and Sterling has like seven. Um, but part of the uh, notion of turning this into a digital humanities lab was that it would support not just specialized D digital humanities work, but also be a great place for any um, user of Yale services, Yale library services to come in. And we didn't want to gateway it and say, gatekeep it and say, you have to be like on a list or you have to have a project. That's one of the reasons the books are around the wall. So you could accidentally walk into the room and then see books on GIS or see books by Sophia Novel on the wall um, and get intrigued by something, whether it's Python programming or critical big data, um, you know, algorithms of oppression or GIS or mapping. And so the question is really great because if you, before um, March, if you stepped in, you'd see a mix of folks doing very specialized work for which they needed special hardware or big screens. And then you'd get folks watching YouTube, you get folks chatting. Um, that's, we were specifically not a quiet space. And so there were some folks who loved that aspect of us. Um, well, my concern about reopening now is that the, the basically the professional staff aren't there. And so I do think that will change the tenor of the room. But it's important to remember, I mean, it'll be less of a DH space, let's be honest. On the other hand, um, we're playing a role in the larger ecosystem of study spaces within Yale Library. Um, Yale is not, by and large, not holding in-person classes. There are some ex exceptions for studio art and sort of wet lab work, and I'm sure a couple others. But by and large, Yale's classes are on Zoom. And this, we are also at de-densified levels holding an undergraduate population on campus. Much smaller than we would normally, but we do have folks, undergrads in dorms. And so what that means is that I think the, the, our digital humanities lab can play a role in offering a space both for specialized digital humanities work, but also just for general um, usage and general studying. And I think that's an incredibly important um, role for the room to play at a time when we're all thinking in six feet distances and we're thinking about social spaces for students to see friends who might, uh, who they'd otherwise run into in class, but they now only see on Zoom or something. Um, Yale's doing a huge renovation of its student center. And so that building is not currently open. The library, I think, is playing an, um, an outsized role in its importance for social interaction, quiet study, medium noise study. Um, and I think that our room fits into that ecosystem of support. So building on that, Peter, someone asks, are there any unanticipated positive aspects to the present environment, the COVID-19 and shift to remote work for your DH lab? So you've talked about some of the benefits for students and, and others, um, and maybe you'd like to add more, but also what about the shift to the remote work? Yeah. Um, I think we, so it's um, interesting to think about um, all of, at least me, I suffer Zoom burnout. I mean, nothing against this, but you know, we're all in these meetings all day long. It's crazy. Um, 
my interactions with my team are actually really positive on Zoom. Or at least I say that. You could ask, poll them if they share the opinion. But I, I think it's, um, it is nice to, um, it reminds me of times we've been together in the past. Um, and it is a reminder of how lucky we were to attract this group of folks to Yale to work with us. Um, I, I, I think that we all struggle with not being able to have those water cooler conversations, those casual interactions. If you just see somebody, all of our offices have glass walls. So if you see somebody, something on somebody's screen, we used to stop by and say, oh, that looks amazing. What are you working on? Um, but I think that what in answer to that challenge of what is, is there any positive? Um, I mean, maybe it's forced us to be a bit more intentional about how we use meeting time or how about how we organize what we're working on or how we discuss it with people. There's certain, although we're a very collaborative group, there's certain things that you want to take off into like a two person Zoom that it's not useful to talk about with a group of five people. Um, I think anything that asks both managers and colleagues to think more carefully about what they're trying to communicate, how they communicate it, balancing um, positivity with sort of creative criticism. I think anything that, that gets us to be sort of better coworkers to each other, uh, even something as awful as the separation from the work environment and this sort of enforced video conferencing regime, I mean, that can have some positive benefits. Thank you. Uh, as a follow-up, um, one of our participants is curious about whether researchers are comfortable using the space without staff nearby and also how access to machines is managed. Now, my impression is that you're not really letting too many people use at least some of the equipment. And how do you keep them away? Have you put it away? Yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, it's a great question. That glass area, what we call the special mm -hmm. products cubes, that does have lockable doors. Yeah. Um, and so, but one of the reasons we architected it like that is we wanted the objects of investigation goggles or whatever, or a special scanner to always be visible, even if they were secured. We didn't want to put them in a basement windowless room because we thought that, um, I mean, ideally you'd walk by the cube and you'd see an English professor putting on the headset, experiencing a poet's house that she helped to document. And that would get you thinking about mixed reality. Um, but even if that professor weren't in that area, you would still see the goggles themselves or maybe a screenshot of her work on the screen. And so maybe that would be sort of generative in some ways. Um, so the, um, that area, because of understandable health concerns, as I said, we just can't have that same access um, to the special, most of the specialized equipment in this current moment. Um, there are even restrictions around collections material. So I should say that when I take a microphone reel off the shelf and I scan it or whatever, I then need to like let it go for X hours where X is determined by environmental health and safety and everything. Um, so there's a lot of, we're all thinking a lot more about what we touch and where we put it and things like that. But it is a great question. I was in the office th this week, I guess Monday, um, seems like a long time ago, and a student came up to me and said, where are the big IMAX? I'm a stats major and I always used to do my stats on the IMAX and they're gone. Um, and I said, I'm really sorry, we've pulled all, we've had to pull every single public access computer with, with a few exceptions for catalog lookup. Um, and that's horrible. And so I, um, for a, somebody who grew to depend on that. And so I contacted a, a colleague over in our science, social science library who told me they're, they're putting up virtual machines and they're trying to install the right software on them. And so I think I was able to get that particular stats major an answer that I think helped him. That's a slide I should have had in here. We did have eight IMAX that had specialized software on them. And we basically now do, need to virtualize that. We need to figure out how can we enable cloud access to a powerful computer that can run Abby Fine Reader OCR or that has ArcGIS on it. Um, so we, that's work that lies ahead of us because all of this has happened so rapidly. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask one final question and ask you to reply first, Peter, and then for Pam to unmute herself and, and uh, reply as well. In our last session, someone asked, how can I make the case for space for digital scholarship when we're able to do so many things without, in the virtual environment. Now, I can glean a lot of things from your presentation, but I would love to hear you put it into a few words to help people make that case. 
You, and uh, you want me to go first, Joan? Yes, please. Okay, great. Yeah, when we were we were trying to figure out what to do with this room, um, this beautiful room in 2015. You know, I thought back to when I was a college student. I was a college student from 93 to 97, and I used to work in a computer lab. And that was such a great, I know it's sound awful, it was such a social space. Because if you, you were suddenly together with other people who worked behind the desk of the computer lab, and you got to exchange ideas and learn from people, and you got to help people, they bring up a floppy disk, my floppy disk died, what do I do? Well, that was in a time in the 90s when Silicon Graphics and Sun and, uh, you know, all sorts of computers were too expensive for a mere mortal to own, but you could come into a computer lab and use them. Most, most kids I knew didn't have computers, laptops or desktops. So what do you do in 2020 when like a thousand dollar MacBook Air will do almost everything you need with the exception of, of deep learning? Um, and to be clear, not everybody can afford a thousand dollar laptop. Um, we do offer check. We used to offer checkouts of those in another department in the library. I don't know how they're dealing with that now. So our answer to architecting the Frankie room was it has to be not a, a, a bank of computers, right? There are spaces that go even more in an extreme like Butler Studio um, with Alex Gill at Columbia, where it's just really a, a blank canvas for whatever people you bring into that room. Um, and so I, and that may have, I'd be interested to, to hear Pam's thoughts on that as you guys have gone through a couple iterations of your space. But so we, um, I think the two quick answers are that it's not an exclusive space. You can come into that space as a biomed undergrad and just read PubMed or whatever those people do. Um, we're not exclusionary and hopefully you'll catch a, you'll catch a book on the wall about facial recognition and start thinking about that in a different way, right? Um, so we're not an exclusive space. And then number two, it had to be about um, displaying the books about DH, displaying the visualizations, which are generally graduate student projects on the walls normally when it's not COVID material. Um, creating a, the first layout I showed with the U-shaped tables, those were four workshops gathered around an enormous virtual, uh, digital monitor so that we could bring, we could create community in that space and say, we're all learning intro to text analysis, but we're also gonna get to know each other. All of those things are things I think we look forward to doing, uh, you know, restarting once this uh, current uh, exigency goes away. But I think my main answer would be um, non-exclusive space um, and space that doesn't fixate on equipment. I know I showed a lot of slides of equipment, but that, that is also flexible and open and lets people just sort of come together in different ways. Um, because we are definitely past the, uh, the computer lab model with just rows and rows of, of CRT monitors. Thank you so much. How about you, Pam? What are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, it's going to be a lot of the same uh, to what Peter said. We similarly designed our space to not look like a computer lab and not function like a computer lab. We have computing labs in the library. We didn't need to recreate that. We really wanted to emphasize humans, so we downplayed technology. We actually keep a lot of our technology hidden most of the time um, because we're really trying to facilitate cross-disciplinary conversation and connection. So making the case for a space uh, when there isn't a space right now is tricky and it's something that I'm, I'm trying to struggle with because you know, I don't wanna do such a good job with the virtual that we no longer need the space. Um, but I think um, for one thing, we've demonstrated that there are certain things that you just can't virtualize. It's really hard to virtualize community. Um, and I think that point of Zoom fatigue that Peter was talking about, we're all, we, we all started feeling it really early on in the pandemic. Um, well, I shouldn't speak for everybody, but I certainly felt that way. Um, and I think the other thing too is that I think the broader case for digital scholarship is more than ever, it's more powerful than ever right now um, because we're not just in this virtual moment that's going to end when it's safe to come back together and act and without social distancing and things like that. I think that we're in a period of transformation. I'm not quite sure what things are going to look like when we emerge, but I think that digital scholarship will be even more centered than it was. And so spaces that support forward thinking innovation and that can support virtual for future fast uh, pivots. Um, I'm thinking in particular being on the West Coast that it's completely in, um, engulfed in flames and smoke right now. This isn't gonna go away. It might, the next crisis might not be public health, it might be environmental, but we're gonna need to be ready to pivot again and so I think that the space can facilitate that kind of thinking that can then function semi-independently from the space, even though the space really does matter. It's sort of this very circular argument that I'm somewhat caught up in right now, trying to make the case for we can still function without the space, but the space is so essential um, to bringing people together, to 
improving access to not gatekeeping, all the things that Peter said. So I'm not sure that I have a perfect answer, but it's one I'm gonna be thinking a lot about in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam and Peter, for your excellent presentations. I learned so much and I hope our participants did as well. Our next webinar is this coming Thursday, September 17th, and our speakers will describe assessment needs and ongoing. Mm -hmm.